Okay, can I start? Ah, yeah. Okay, so we are the last one before lunch. So we are talking about um, Android, uh, about the security of Android Password Manager. My name is uh, Stefan Huber. This is my colleague Stephen Arts, and our third um, colleague Siegfried Rasthofer cannot be here, unfortunately. At first, a bit about me. I'm a security researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute. I'm working at the test lab for uh, mobile security. And around, I think, two years ago, my colleagues Stephen, Siegfried, and me, we founded a small uh, hacking group out of uh, colleagues and, and students. And we meet uh, once a week in our spare time for some pizza and drinking and so on. And there we look in different interesting topics. And um, this presentation will now be the results of one of our projects. And at first, I hand over to Stephen for a short introduction. Then I will start the talk. And at the end, will be finished again by, by Stephen. Thanks, Stefan. So uh, I'm Steven, I'm also part of the, the hacking group and of Rano for SIT, and I'm a researcher in security as well as program analysis. So my main topic is applying methods of static and dynamic program analysis to programs to automatically find bugs and defects. And I also enjoy hacking and pizza. Okay. I also want to thank all our, our students and other group members, as I already mentioned, without their work and uh, support we would not be here. Um, I think everybody is aware of the problem. You use different services, mail, YouTube, whatever, and for each service you need some, some account credentials, password. Everywhere you have a password policy, you know, length, 100 characters, uppercase, lowercase, digits, Chinese sign, Klingon, whatever. And for each account, security uh, specialists also recommend different passwords. And there's now a very nice Gardner study which says an average a user has around uh, 90 different passwords. And the problem is now, how do you keep all these passwords in mind? So the stupid solution, put it somewhere on a post-it, on your keyboard, write it down or something. So the, the software developers they recognized the problem and introduced so-called password manager. For instance, everybody knows that the internal password manager of uh, Firefox. So if you have now any web service, you can store your credentials in the password manager. And if you go to the site, the, the password manager automatically fills the uh, form. And the third part are so-called third-party password managers. They also support, for instance, application. And um, this, this third-party password manager are focus or was, were focus of our study. So if we look at some advertisement promise, you will see that they pronounce um, bank level security, military grade security, whatever. And uh, this is in, in some kind, it's legitimate because they use AES 256 bit encryption. And as much I know or we know currently, AES is not really broken. It's a secure algorithm. But uh, the question is, we do not want to break the encryption itself, but are there any ways, implementation flaws, logic flaws, whatever, that we can just simply bypass the encryption? Um, here is a short overview about the Android apps. We, we take a look into it. As you can see, there are some well-known password managers like Dashlane, LastPass, or, or Keeper Security, but also a bit uh, not so well-known small implementations so we have a good good mixture of uh, different code. There was no special reasons why we choose this one. This is just randomly picked. We have a few students. We group them up and take a look into them. Okay, what, what can a password manager, or what defines a, a, a typical password manager? So the first feature function, of course, is storing your passwords confidential somewhere in, in an encrypted file, in a database, or in some other container. The second feature they provide is also synchronization. So you don't, do not only store the, the credentials um, locally on your device, you can synchronize it in a more or less secure way with the provider backend. So if you new, use the password manager, for instance, also on a Windows desktop, you just can, can synchronize your container. We have a called autofill feature, which 
is just if you go to a website or open an application, the, the password manager automatically detects this uh, application and automatically pastes your credential into the form. Some also deliver a custom browser, which makes it easier to, to handle the autofill function, and also some convenience or comfort feature. For instance, if for each password manager you need a master password, and if you cannot remember to the master password or if you are too lazy, you just can shorten this and use a four-digit PIN. And the question and our target was now, can we somehow compromise these features without any root? If we, let's say, have root access on the device, uh, the security is nearly broken by design because then we can bypass the sandbox, we can, can dump the memory, we can, can lock the, the, the key input and, and fish the password. So our target was now to find logic flaws or implementation flaws to, to compromise this feature without any root privileges. Okay, the first let a problem, let's call it backup problem. This is not really a vulnerability or something. This is just, a, let's say, more or less design flaw. It depends on the context of the application. Uh, this feature can make problems or, or not. Um, I will show this more now in detail. Let's assume some, some attacker get physical access to, the, to your device. He steals it, he finds it, and he can somehow bypass the lock screen. So like there's a weak pattern or a smudge attack or, or whatever. So in the first step, he then just simply connects the device to your computer and he can activate the so-called debug feature. The ADB feature is some developer support uh, on an Android device which allows you to connect your PC with the device. If he can now, if he can uh, connect the device now to the computer, he can open via ADB some shell. But this shell is still restricted. This means the sandboxing is, in, uh, is active. He cannot look into the local app folder. He cannot copy your, for instance, uh, um, stored credentials, whatever. But um, if the developer, for instance, define a flag in the app, this is called allow backup flag, there's activated some, some backup feature. This means the, the attacker or the, the owner of the device can now use the ADB to backup this, the target application. This backup of the target application is more or less um, a simple um, container which can convert it to an tar archive. And in this archive is now all the, the data from the local app folder. And this app um, this archive, he can now, on the, on the computer, he can now extract this folder. And there, for instance, there was one password manager, he had a so-called key storage file, and if you look at this key store file, there was stored the master password or the master secret just in plain text. So here we have two things. The one is the problem of the design decision activating the backup feature, which is, which is not really required on this app because it has the synchronizing mechanism with the backend. So this flag is, is uh, not necessary. And on the other side, as you can see, storing the, the master key or master password in plain text is not the best idea. So as I already talked a lot about the, the sandboxing and the, open, um, and the local app folder, here is another way, or we tried another way to bypass it. Let's assume there is no backup flag and we have no root. Um, there is another way. At first, a short introduction. Uh, on Android, you, you have millions of apps, and so you also have uh, a lot of different browsers, more than on desktop um, world. We have also Firefox and other solutions. And as I said, already mentioned, the, the password manager provides some kind of autofill feature. So you see on the corner our password manager, and the, the idea of the manager is now we want to paste automatically our credential in, in, this, in this field when the user wants to log in into a service. And the best solution would be if we, we paste the credentials and use some kind of common API from which we can access the browser elements. But the problem is, as I mentioned, different browser, different technique, different providers. There is no such API. So this approach is not working. And some password manager um, vendor had an idea. So we provide our own browser because the browser is part of the app. So this means we can control the browser 
And if it's uh, because it's our browser, we can use this autofill feature. But um, with this self-implemented browser, you can imagine it's not so easy to implement a browser in a correct way. And so we thought perhaps we can use this browser as some kind of attack point. And the idea is now to abuse this browser when we have access, for instance, to the device, can we use this uh, abuse this browser to jump into the local app folder? So to say it simple, somehow bypass the, the sandboxing. Okay, how is the browser constructed? At first, as I already said, the browser is part of the application. So this is just, let's say, one bundle. And this means the browser is running in the same process as the application, so it's part of the whole sandbox. This means the browser has also access to the local files of the application. Um, browsers, or to implement a browser on, on Android is not so, so difficult. So you don't have to, to implement your own uh, browser engine or whatever. Uh, you just can use an API, which is called the WebView. Uh, in the past, it was based on the, the WebKit engine. Now it's based on the, the Chromium engine. And with this API, you can very easy uh, implement uh, browser feature. And another important funny fact is the web view supports file URIs or file access. So now imagine this is our browser bar from the self-implemented browser. What will happen now if we enter just the, the um, path of the application folder and for instance some XML file which contains the stored password master uh, key or other other information. Yep, it will be listed. As you can see, this looks a bit strange. This is one example of a password manager which uses some obfuscation. This is just an MD5 value of the attribute uh, pin code value. So as you can imagine, the next one is the stored um, pin or master password. As you can see, on the one side, it's base64 encoded but it's also encrypted. Um, there's a classic uh, encryption with some key and the, the plain text. Um, the question is now, um, yeah, the master, uh, we have the master password, it's encrypted. How can we decrypt it or how can we break it? And um, this question will now answer my colleague, Steven. Okay, so a lot of people do crypto to protect things, especially in password managers. But unfortunately, most of that crypto is kind of severely broken. Let me just go back a couple of decades to, to a guy called Kirchhoff. And he just said, whenever you're doing crypto, make sure that the crypto system is safe as long as no one knows the key, but people can know everything else in the world, like how your algorithm works, what the name of your grandmother is. It doesn't matter as long as he doesn't have the key. He shouldn't be able to break his system. This is fairly well known. Uh, this guy is dead for a while now. But anyway, it still fails for, for many apps. Now, uh, let's first look into how you would normally assume that a kind of sensible password manager implements encryption. You have a master password that is entered by the user and that protects the password database. So you would assume that somehow the user password is used to encrypt the password database. You get a cipher text, you dump it on disk unless you know the user password, you're out of luck. What would you do? You would take the user password, put it into some uh, key derivation function like pvkdf2 uh, plus some salt. This gives you a key which you then put into a cipher to encrypt your database. You get a cipher text. I'm rushing a bit through this. Essentially, this just means you have a proper algorithm here that you can look, uh, look up in a good crypto textbook, use a proper implementation that is already there in Android, use another proper algorithm from the textbook with a proper implementation that is there on Android. Um, now, where can this break? Some applications, for example, they, instead of putting there a proper salt, they put a, a static value. So what this salt is about, it adds some randomness to the key derivation. Because if we do not have this salt, then this means every user password that runs through the KDF leads to the same encryption key. This means I can pre-compute a table, like a rainbow table, and then, this takes me some time, but then I can very efficiently crack all installations of the password manager by just applying this table to this KDF process. With the salt, however, this means that the salt kind of customizes the KDF. So I would need to generate one table per salt. 
which makes it fairly inefficient to have pre-computation. Again, this only works if everybody's using a different salt. So just putting a hard-coded salt of zero is not going to do the trick, but we have been, seen this various times. The next um, kind of bad idea we've seen various times is people take the user password and then they say, okay, let's encrypt the user password and put it on disk. To encrypt something, we need a key. Hey, let's take a hard-coded key that is inside the application. Now the problem here is, I can simply go ahead, decompile the password manager application, extract the hard-coded key from the decompiled code, and then I can simply take the ciphertext that is stored um, and decrypt it using the key I have obtained from the source code. And this is exactly what happens. This is exactly how we got back the master password from the stuff that Stefan showed in the XML file. We decompile the app, here you see there are two parts of the key. There is some deterministic algorithm that takes part one, that takes part two, generates some key out of it, and this is used to encrypt the master password, and this is put into the XML file. So I just reverse the process. I just generate that key because it's static anyway. I decrypt, okay, here is the AS key. I decrypt the password from this, and I'm happy, and I have the master password. If you go back to the diagram, this wouldn't even have been necessary because the ciphertext itself is already used as a key in the next step, so why bother with the user password? You could just run ahead. Um, why do people do this in the first place? Um, sometimes this is used because they have a convenience feature to have, um, to have a pin code instead of the master password. So this means they use the master password to encrypt the database, but you can also have a substitute, like a four-digit pin, that you can also use to unlock your password manager. In that case, they say, hey, I just verified the pin at some point, and now I have a good way to get back the master password to decrypt the database. Of course, this breaks the whole security. We'll come back to the aspect of these convenience features later on. Then the, the next topic when it comes to broken crypto is um, when people have something they want to encrypt, like a database, um, you have a key, you need some magic function to generate a ciphertext out of the database. The best way is really to use some known and trusted algorithm such as AES. Or if you want to transport data securely to a server, use something like TLS. But unfortunately, we very often see that people come up with their own crypto algorithms. So there's some weird bit shifting and some arithmetics going on and people say, hey, I can't read it anymore, so it's probably going to be secure. Usually it's not. Uh, mostly it doesn't take more than an hour to actually break the crypto algorithm that people have come up with, J just don't do it, but the sad story is it crops up every now and then. Same story here, um, there are actually apps that use HTTP connections for synchronizing your password database, and to secure that there is some yeah, algorithm people just came up with um, for encryption, and that is usually pretty weak. Um, never do your own crypto, ever. So do not come up with your own crypto algorithm, it just fails. Do not try to implement AES on your own. It just fails. And as I said, I'm not making this up. This is something we see every now and then cropping up in real-world apps with millions of downloads. Now, for something slightly different. So we have seen that sometimes you need to exchange sensitive data between apps or between an app and a website because when the user wants to log in into his password manager and then say, okay, connect me to Facebook, he doesn't want to show the password in the password manager then remember it, go to Facebook, type it in again. He wants the app to kind of place the Facebook password into the Facebook website or the Facebook app and go ahead. This, however, leads to a certain problem because the password manager needs to inject this um, sensitive information into the website or into the app. And as Stefan already said, the sandboxing model of Android usually prevents that. Now, what do some of these password managers do? Stefan mentioned the, uh, the own browser. Okay, some do that. Others, they just say, hey, why not just put it into the clipboard and then the user can paste it over here. Sure he can, but guess what we did? We created a small app that just pulls the clipboard. And whenever the password manager writes something into the clipboard, we dump it out to disk. You can collect a fair amount of passwords with that. Um, so how can we be more intelligent? If, if we say the clipboard is probably not the best way to store a password, 
By the way, some apps, they do not even remove it from the clipboard after some time, so it stays there forever until you copy something else to the clipboard. Um, a slightly better way what people figured out are so-called accessibility managers. In Android, accessibility managers are small services that apps can provide to the system that help you interact with the user interface. So assume you're driving, then you can't just pick up your phone and enter some characters. So an accessibility manager can enter characters on your behalf, for example, via text-to-speech engine or whatnot. It's simply something that can interact as your agent with the user interface. So what these guys did is they said, let's implement an accessibility manager because the accessibility manager has full access to the user interface. It can enter the username, it can enter the password, it can even click on sign in for me. And the same goes not only for websites, but for apps, because for the um, accessibility manager, in fact, the web browser is just another random app with which it interacts. Now, the questions we ask are, can we actually divert the data that is supposed to go into the legitimate website to some non-legitimate website and then just get access to the user's password? And the next question, if the data is supposed to go into the app, can we divert it to a different app and get hold of the passwords? Because we all like passwords. So imagine you have something that is HTTPS login.foo.com and you store a password for that one. What we did is we created a website login.foo.com and just uh, fiddled around with the DNS to map login.foo.com to our website. We didn't break the SSL, so we just said this website doesn't support SSL. And... The fun thing is, many password managers still happily inserted the password into HTTP login.foo.com because they just said, well, it's login.foo.com, so who cares? Just put it in there. Got us quite some passwords. Um, and even worse, um, imagine you have a password stored for h.wordpress.com. This is just some WordPress block, right? Um, some of these password managers will put it into everything that is WordPress.com. So if you just host another blog on WordPress.com, everybody can get a subdomain on WordPress.com for his own blog. The password manager will fill in the password for a.wordpress.com into everything.wordpress.com. So essentially, all the WordPress passwords can get, go to every WordPress site. Because what these people did is they say, we only compare the top-level domain. And here's why. We, of course, we asked the vendors, why did you implement it that way? And they said, it's because of single sign-on. Imagine you're at a university, you have something like courses.foo.edu, and you have, um, let's say, library.foo.edu, and they said, it's probably going to be the same password anyway. So you, we don't want you to have to create two entries for the same credentials, so we just make sure that if you're on foo.edu, all the subdomains receive your passwords, so that you can conveniently log in. If I register attacker.foo.edu, well, I get the passwords. Um, we had some debates with the, um, with the developers whether this is intended or not. Um, ah, next funny story. So assume we have stored a password for, for the Twitter app. Um, now, the idea is, how can we get the, the password for the, that is stored for the Twitter app and that the accessibility server would normally put into the Twitter app to log me in. In some cases, it was totally sufficient to create an app with a package name com.twitterleak because the password manager just said, okay, if this password is stored for com.twitter and um, I have an app that starts with com.twitter, then I'm going to put in the password because, hey, it's Twitter. No, it's not. Um, yeah, kind of the, the algorithm they do is is not not really secure. They just take the, the website address, twitter.com, so that the password is valid for the website as well as the app, reverse it, and check whether the prefix matches, and then just dump it in there. Uh, I think we have time for a short demo. Oops. Oops. Okay. So what you see here is we just open the the password manager 
type in our type in our master password because now we're the legitimate user. We have a legitimate app on our phone and we have also been, been tricked into installing a non-legitimate app, but we would normally never type our password into the non-legitimate app. So what we now do is, right, give it a second. We activate this um, accessibility service because we need to grant the password manager app the right to interact with user interfaces on our behalf. Yeah, we get a couple of warnings from the Android OS, but this is normally the Avast password manager. We're not cheating anything at this point. This is just Avast. Um, okay, now we're set and good to go. And what we do now is, you see here, this is com.twitter.twitter.leak. This was created by us. And you see our Twitter credentials appearing in here. Because the password manager just put it in there without thinking any of anything. Okay, so much for the demo. Um, just very quickly, there's also something called residue attacks. Imagine you have Facebook installed and you have a, a password manager and it has credentials for Facebook stored and it inserts into an app and it, this time it checks the full package name like com.facebook. Of course, you cannot have a second app on the same phone that is also com.facebook, so you're pretty safe, right? No. What you can do is, um, if you as an attacker have access to the, um, to the phone, but you do not have the master password of the password manager, so you would normally not get the stored passwords, you can simply deinstall the Facebook app, create your own app that is com.facebook, and because they only check the package name, there you go, the password will be written into your fake app. Uh, I'd like to rush this one a bit. Um, there is also a second type of residue attack. Um, the Dashlane um, password manager has the ability to synchronize with the backend. So what they did is they store the credentials that are used for synchronizing with the Dashlane backend into the Android account manager, which is simply a service that abstracts from a database controlled by the Android operating system. So what Dashlane does, it registers the account type com.dashlane, puts in your Dashlane email address and password for the backend. And the Android app is associated with a certain user ID. Now, what happens when I try to create a fake app that also tries to access the com.dashlan account type? There will be a collision because the, the fake app is registered with a different user ID to the Android operating system. Now, what happens if I uninstall the original Dashlane app? In that case, the accounts are still stored in the system's account database because just deinstalling an app doesn't delete things from the account manager. Now, there is no collision anymore with the user ID of the original password manager, and the system will happily grant me access and give me the data. We have a live uh, demo for that. I'll skip it in the interest of time. If you're interested, you can come up to one of us later. And this is really that easy. So this is essentially the exploit code for the residue attack. Um, there's no magic behind it. You just need to have the same account type, and you need to deinstall the other app first. Demo time? Yep. We'll just skip that one. Um, with this in mind, and even the Android developer documentation clearly states it, you should never pass the Android's, uh, Android user's actual password to the account manager because it's simply not intended to do that. It is intended to store some session token, some key, uh, something that is derived that can be thrown away, that is not super sensitive but not an actual password. But who cares to read the documentation? Um, so this is not about uh, bashing the, the developers of the password managers. It's more like common pitfalls, things where you need to be really careful when dealing with sensitive data, like passing data between applications, using the Android credential store, uh, implementing an accessibility service. All these things can go really badly wrong. And the sad story is more often than not they do. This is just a table what we found in which app. It's also on our website with all the details. You can find all the write-ups there, um, the individual vulnerability reports. Um, I think it's time to come to an end at some point. No? Ten minutes. Ah, that's awesome. Um, convenience features. We have talked about the, the possibility to... Um, substitute your master password with a four-digit PIN. Almost all password managers support this feature. 
Um, the problem is this is very convenient for a user. You just grab your phone and instead of typing in 300 characters master password, you just type in four digits and you're gone. The problem is um, brute forcing a four digit password that can only be digits is something that doesn't take too long. So um, this already weakens the security. And then you have the problem that usually the, da master, uh, the password database is encrypted with something derived from the master password. So if they want you to be able to unlock the database with a pin as well, they have to do some trickery to store the original key, encrypt the key with a pin as well, or just dump the key to disk and hope that no one finds it so that the pin unlock is kind of safe enough. So th this whole story of allowing you to use a short pin instead of something that is long and secure kills it off in many cases. And it's actually a trade-off between comfort and security here. Same direction, you can save your password with some of these password managers, like save the master password for me as well, um, and then just use the pin. <sighs> not so really good. The whole autofill story, so many of the bugs we found were not in the encryption of the, the password database itself. If you have, oops, sorry, if you have pin disabled and you really have uh, a sensible implementation, but then things like, autofill where someone didn't check hey where am I filling in that stuff that then broke it or a feature like this single sign on I take all the subdomains because they belong to the same realm anyway I can just put in the password this is what killed off most of the password managers uh, as a summary so what would we recommend because we don't just want to bash people we want to do something good um, Use secret storage for passwords and keys. This means do not just write it into a file and hope that the Android sandboxing model will take care of it. Use proper crypto, no own algorithms. I've gone on for quite a time about this topic, but it really happens again and again. Never use hard-coded keys, also a favorite one. Uh, if the keys are in the code, they're public. It's super easy, even if you... Uh, obfuscate the hell out of your app, it's super easy to deobfuscate it. Even if you put the keys in native code, it probably takes us uh, 15 minutes for native code, slightly longer. Um, whenever you're passing sensitive information, just validate the receivers. Never trust that someone who's claiming to be a certain app or a certain website to just be it. For example, for an app, if you want to know whether the guy is really com.facebook, Check the certificate with which it was signed, not just check the package name. If you're using communication, then use TLS. Do not try to layer something on top of HTTP. It will usually break. Now, we're through the presentation, and since we have more time than I thought, I can actually show you the second demo. This was the residue attack that I skipped. Um, let me just get this to the other screen. This was the Dashlane Password Manager. So what we do here is we, we start the normal Password Manager, enter our super secure master password. I think it's master or master, yeah, it's master password. And we see we have a key for, for Twitter in here. In the settings, we enable that we want to be able to use a four-digit PIN code instead of the, the normal master password. Okay, yeah, we remembered it. And now, as a next step, we'll start our attacker application. Okay, we, we tried it once again first. Like when we now come up, we don't have to enter the long master password, we just have to enter the the pin. And we're again in the application and we can see our credentials for Twitter here. And this is the script that, that we have for for our exploit which just means that we, we grab the, the account database from the, um, from the phone. 
and we can see that the, the stored account is, is actually in there. But this was just uh, a demonstration to show you how, how Android stores this account. The real attack is now in our, in our app. This works, what you see on the right side on the phone, this works without any root permissions. So we first try to register the account, the account type for com.dashlane. We see, okay, this ID is already in there because the Dashlane application has already registered the type com.dashlane. What we now do is we get rid of the Dashlane app, okay? And now we can extract the password because even if we uninstall the Dashlane app, the com.dashlane account type is still in there in the database. And now since we are the only one requesting access to com.dashlane, we are also the first one and the first one always wins when he tries to get access because this is how the security of the, the Android account manager works. And this is why the documentation says never put any sensitive stuff in there. Okay, now you also had the, the demo video. Oops. And I guess that's it from, from our side and we're happy to take questions. Yes. Vendor response. Yes, all the issues we have uh, shown here have been fixed by the by the vendors. Sometimes with a bit of discussion, I mentioned the point about um, matching all the subdomains to the same credentials. So the v first, the vendor said, "Yeah, you know, it's a feature; it's not a bug." Okay, um, but all of them have replied. Yes. Sorry. Key store. There's the key store API. This is the only reliable storage. I know in the in the older version it's not supported, but um, since Android 4.4, there is the key storage API, and also in the newer version, there's also a secure hardware module behind it. So this is the only secure storage, and it's also designed for storing keys or credentials. Uh, it, it sometimes has problems that it throws exceptions when uh, uh, the user suddenly creates a lock screen or something like that. And it's very hard to reproduce locally, etc. Have you encountered anything like that? Yeah, the, this is uh, it's true, as you said, in the, in the earlier versions, without any hardware support, the user is forced to, to also um, create a, an additional lock screen because the encryption for the key store is derived from this lock screen. But this is the problem of the security. You need somewhere some secret element. And in this case, the secret element is the lock screen. Uh, there, there is no other possibility to, to get us really, as, you, as we say, secure storage. And um, Well, the, the newer phones, they do have the hardware module. Yeah, as I said, just then if you develop now an app, you have to decide or make a if condition which API you use. If you have a newer one, use the key store in the other one, inform the user, you have to set a lock, this must be secure. There is no no other, um, other, other way, let's say it in this way, because this is how crypto works. Thanks. Any More questions? Question? Okay. Then, if there are no more questions, I think there's a lunch coming up, right? Uh, yes, we have one hour lunch break. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.